Welcome to the Arabic Hour. I'm Susan Akram, and I'm very pleased today to have uh, two young activists who we are going to talk about organizing with uh, for the next uh, approximately an hour. Um, and welcome to Laila Ruri and uh, Dalia Falehan, uh, both uh, just graduated, so congratulations Thank to you. both of you. Um, I want to give a very brief introduction and then um, we'll hear from them uh, about their uh, experiences organizing in, um, in college and, and outside. Laila Aruri is a recent graduate of UMass Amherst. Uh, she's majored in public health sciences and concentrated in reprodu reproductive health, rights and justice. She was president of the Students for Justice in Palestine uh, there at UMass uh, during the, this last academic year. Uh, and we're so pleased to have Lila uh, because she's carrying on a wonderful tradition from her uh, grandfather, who's very well known to this audience, uh, Nasira Ruri, and her grandmother, Joyce Aruri, uh, who have left her with an unwavering commitment to human rights for everyone, as she puts it. Dalia Falehan is uh, my own student at uh, um, Boston University Law School. She's just graduated from BU Law School. She was a member of Northwestern University's chapter of Students for Justice in Palestine and was one of the organizers of the uh, Divest uh, campaign there. Um, she participated in the International Human Rights Law Clinic at BU Law School and has organized BU's chapter of the National Lawyers Guild. Uh, she's interned with both the National Immigrant Justice Center and with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, uh, and she's a former director of the Boston University chapter of the International Refugee Assistance Program. So welcome to both of you. Thank you. Uh, I'll start with, uh, with Lila. Um, and have you just talk about your how you became engaged uh, in SJP, what you have been doing in terms of the organizing, and uh, where that has led you? So growing up uh, under you know the guise of my grandfather and my grandmother, um, I always knew that Palestine and being Palestinian was a huge part of who I was, but I didn't really know how to articulate it in an environment where I grew up in a uh, very white, very affluent community uh, outside of Boston. And so I actually didn't really get involved with Palestine at all until my grandfather passed away uh, the spring of my freshman year of college. And I was talking to my grandmother and she said, you know, I would just love for you to go to a Students for Justice in Palestine meeting. Just try it. And at the time I was running three seasons as a division one athlete at the university. I was very involved in sports. I really wasn't very involved in politics, uh, but you know, it's my grandmother. And, uh, and so I went and I really felt almost instantaneously that there was, here was a place where I could really grapple with this identity that I had kind of suppressed for so long. Um, in an environment that was very inclusive and uh, very understanding, and um, and I fell in love with it. So I started going to meetings as often as I could. Um, I ended up leaving the track and cross country team in the end of my sophomore year uh, because I felt that it was really important to pursue this kind of work, um, in addition to many other many other factors. But so my junior year of college, I was. Um, elected as the event coordinator for uh, the um, the board of UMass Students for Justice in Palestine. And there I think I, f I felt really confident in that position. I felt like I really had a role and I was able to make a difference. So um, I brought in one speaker the fall of my sophomore year, or my junior year. Um, Pamela Olson, who is the author of a book that I really uh, enjoyed. And um, it was great. It was a lot of work, but it ended up being like a really wonderful experience. And I just sort of kept going with it. So most recently, I just finished organizing an event uh, with, my, with my other board members at, at UMass. And it was titled Reproductive 
justice, intersectional feminism in Palestine. And it looked at a lot of the ways in which organizing around Palestine is often very racialized and gendered mm -hmm. in and of itself. Um, and how can we learn from these Palestinian women who are on the forefront of organizing and resisting occupation, but also uh, organizing schools and health care and really a full government in Laos of occupation. Uh, so, you know, that was a wonderful experience. Um, I know that Dahlia has had a lot of experience with BDS. We have a very young SJP at UMass. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that it was sort of falling apart with me and a few other when me and a few other women kind of pieced it back together. Uh, mm -hmm. But we're really excited to see where it goes. And of course, I just graduated, but I'm so happy to keep in touch with SJP at UMass and help them in whatever way I can as, as a postgraduate student. So, Wonderful. Yeah. So let me ask the same question yeah. of Dahlia, how you got started. And so, yeah, I mean, kind of, kind of similar, you know, um, when I, when I got to college, I actually started at Oberlin College and transferred to Northwestern after a year, but it was a very sort of different environment from what I was used to. I went to a city public school in Chicago, and Oberlin was just uh, the polar opposite mm -hmm. of kind of what I, the environment that I had been used to, and I was trying to figure out, you know, where I fit in and what I was looking for, and I stumbled into their chapter of Students for a Free Palestine. Mm -hmm. um, and I had had some experience with activism and organizing just having gone to a Chicago public high school, um, you know, organizing against budget cuts and firing teachers and things like that is something that those students have to do regularly. Um, and it's, it became a lot more prominent after I left. So um, I was sort of looking for that sort of political bent and also finding a group of people that understood who I was and where I came from was really important and it sort of took off from there. So that when I went to Northwestern, I immediately just went and looked for the SJP. Um, and kind of like you said, it was not much of a cohesive group at the time. They had had a lot of people graduate a couple of years ago and the group sort of fell apart. Um, so it was a small group of women, myself included, that sort of pieced it back together. And in three years, we were able to build up to a divestment campaign that was uh, actually successful, which we weren't expecting at all. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, so we were planning on it for the, the full three years that we sat down one day and said, what do we want this group to move towards? Because um, we were really building it up essentially from scratch. And we all said, well, BDS is becoming a thing. Uh, people are trying to push these through student governments. And so that's, what, that's what we want to do. BDS boycott. being boycott, divestments, and sanctions. Mm -hmm which is the, um, the tactics that Palestinian civil society asked uh, the international community to use um, to achieve their three goals of ending the occupation, dismantling the wall, and the right of return for all refugees. Um, and it's been uh, a, a, a big tool that college students have been using uh, to encourage universities to divest, sort of modeled after the anti-apartheid movement. Um, and so we just sort of said, this is what we want to do. And everything that we are going to do in the next couple of years is going to be building toward that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, we, I mean, we structured, we, we had events, we tried to build up a group first to have a base of people who are organizing, establish a presence through speaker events, uh, student teach-ins, uh, writing articles in, in, the, in the school paper, things like that, just to get the information out there, get our faces out there, and put Palestine sort of on everyone's radar mm -hmm. in the community. So we spent about two years doing that. And then uh, in my final year of school, we said, OK, this is the year that we're going to do it. Um, and we start, and we also spent a lot, a lot of time in those previous two years building coalitions with other affinity groups, other social justice groups, um, because there's usually a lot going on on different campus campuses and organizing tends to be issue specific, but there is a lot of connections between, say, Black Lives Matter or immigrant rights or environmentalism or feminist movements and everything in Palestine. So we tried to have, we did this thing uh, in my sophomore year of college. We wanted to do an Israeli apartheid week, but we didn't have the resources and we didn't have the time to do a whole week of planning. So we said, let's just bring everybody in and have a social justice week and have a series mm -hmm. of events and different groups would use their resources and so on to put on all of these events. And so that was sort of the cohesive 
moment um, <coughs> where everyone started talking to each other, which ended up being hugely important for when we did the divestment movement because Northwestern is a very, very white uh, school. There isn't a lot of, there aren't, a, there were, I think, maybe three or four Palestinian <laughs> students and possibly 10 or 15 Arab students. So we didn't have that kind of a base to push this through. Um, and having alliances with um, the Latina Student Union, Mecha, which is uh, a Chicano organization, mm -hmm. the Black Student Union, um, you know, all of the different affinity groups. We had some environmental groups working with us and things like that really helped establish a base of support. And they were really amazing when we announced the divestment resolution. They all just sort of like came right behind us and said, this is what's important right now and we're going to help you do this because it matters. Um, and, and so we were actually able to get it passed. Amazing, yeah. amazing. And it sounds like the drawing in of this diverse group of students was really critical yes. to that success. Uh, so Lila, what, was, what has the strategy been at UMass uh, in terms of the focus of SJP? So I see a lot of what Dahlia did in her first few years as sort of the baseline for what we're working towards right now. So um, a lot of the last two years of SJP for me have been building those coalitions. A lot of the groups that you mentioned are in existence at UMass and have been very supportive at just even showing up at events and actions that are on a smaller scale um, has been you know, has made all the difference for us because one of the hardest things about organizing is that you're you're prepared for all of this backlash, but at the same time, there's no way to prepare for that. And you really need that system of support and that network of coalition building and community support. So we've done a lot of that. We've done a lot. We've worked very closely with uh, SEPA, which is the Center for Education Policy and Advocacy at UMass. And we've also worked very closely with um, Prison Abolition Collective, which is also in its early stages, so we kind of lean on each other in terms of what organizing looks like and garnering resources and support and things like that. Um, but again, too, what Dahlia said is putting our face on the map. You know, people would come up to us, so we held an event at the beginning of this previous school year in September, and it was just an open event for anyone to come by and who may be interested in SJP. Uh, we asked community members to come, we asked faculty to come and just talk with us about what we're doing, what we're working towards, what our goals are and what we need. And we had a lot of really amazing people show up and show interest, but they were like, I didn't know SJP was still in existence. Mm -hmm. And we were like, well, that's what we want to work on. So a lot of this year was writing for the Collegian uh, and co-sponsoring events. Co-sponsorship, I think, can be just as important as having your own event. It not only allows you to show up for other people in the same way that you want them to show up for you, but you learn a lot and you build that intersectional analysis of what it means to be advocating for Palestine, but also to be advocating for social justice more broadly. And uh, we've also just been putting ourselves out there in terms of events. Um, so that's what a lot, of, a lot of what that has looked like for us. But at the same time, we're always thinking of that BDS campaign. That's always in the back of our mind because that is the end goal. Not the end goal. There is no you know, end goal to social justice. But that is you know, what we want to work towards. So um, I think one thing that we've gathered from other groups who have done this sort of campaign is that sometimes you do just want to focus on one aspect of divestment. So for instance, Caterpillar is hugely used at UMass. Uh, UMass is constantly going up through construction as they renovate the campus and such. Uh, and so that's sort of always been in our mind as maybe, you know, we want to focus on one or two things instead of taking on all of BDS, which I think can seem incredibly overwhelming and sort of, you know, kind of 
have give people this idea that maybe it's just too much. Mm -hmm. So I think that like learning from other groups who have done this thing, going to the national SJP conference has been hugely important Mm -hmm. in terms of learning from other group campuses and from other people. Also just feeling like this is something that is so achievable. You know, it's so, it's so, it's right there. Mm -hmm. You know, we just have to be ready. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think that we're getting very close. Well, both of you have talked a lot about how about the importance of intersectionality, reaching out to other groups, finding common social justice issues. How has that worked in terms of putting a specific BDS campaign for Palestine in the middle of that? I mean, I'm hearing something different from both of you. I'd like you to talk a little bit more about that, Lila. So how do you bring together all of these Mm. causes, but yet focus on something so specific that requires very Mm. specific and concrete kinds of actions Mm -hmm. to achieve it. And it's about Palestine when you're trying to bring all these groups together. How has that worked at UMass? So I think, first, I'll, I'll start by saying that when I came to Palestine, it was at the same time that I was coming to a lot of different social justice Mm. issues. This wasn't always something that uh, I had an easy time with. And so really grappling with my identity as a Palestinian American at the same time as I was at a university that uh, was very committed to understanding different social justice specific issues, um, my understanding of Palestine has never just been Palestine. Mm. So I think Especially, um, I I got involved with this Reproductive Health Rights and Justice Certificate in the Five College area my sophomore year. This was the same time that I really began to organize and focus on Palestine. I realized how intersectional and how, how integrative all of these movements are. Uh, and one of, the, uh, one of the things that I found is that we're not the only ones trying to put material and uh, economic pressure on cert- to get a certain result, right? So Prison Abolition Collective is doing the same thing. There was, um, they're also gearing up for a divestment campaign that we've actually talked about doing uh, and in a sort of cohesive, mm. sort of coexisting, uh, our, two, our two struggles and connecting them. But there was also, um, I can't remember the name of it, but an environmental justice group at our school did a did a divestment sit in divestment campaign that was successful divesting from fossil fuels. Mm-hmm. So there is um, this is something that has proven to be successful and it's proven to be effective. And I think now because all of we've connected with all of these other groups, we see that uh, you know there's this is a really effective measure and it's something that is can be uh, utilized in more of a broader broader sense than just Palestine. But of course I think too is that if you want people to be there for you when you are doing a divestment campaign for Palestine, you need to be there for them when they're doing their campaigns around uh, divesting from prisons and divesting from fossil fuels and uh, di- you know, we, we sort of think of it in a, like, what is our university investing in? Are they investing in socially conscious and responsible organizations? And, uh, and, and, um, and they're not. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. so a lot of the times that collective frustration can actually be used to build a really powerful baseline mm-hmm. uh, that's a lot more... Uh, generative than just, you know, a small group of kids who want to divest from Palestine. Mm -hmm. It's a really powerful feeling, I think. Uh, uh, So Dahlia, coming from the, from a successful VDS campaign, uh, was Northwestern one of the first schools to pass a divestment Um, resolution? We weren't one of the first schools. Well, I mean, we were sort of earlier on Mm. in in, I guess the grand scheme of things, but we passed, so spring of 2015 is when um, 
Northwestern passes divestment resolution, and there were so many resolutions that got passed within a, like a two month time frame. They mm -hmm. called it Divestapalooza because <laughs> it was just like um, a couple of UC schools, the UC region, Stanford, Northwestern went through. I mean, mm -hmm. there was just so many. Um, Stanford and Northwestern actually were back to back. Like mm. one night Stanford, one night Northwestern. It was and Michigan was in there. Somewhere. Michigan wasn't six. Michigan goes like every successful. year, and oh. they they keep getting so close. Mm. Um, but um, I mean, part of part of what I think one of the things that helped um, with the coalition building and pushing the divestment resolution through is that we were coming off of the summer of 2014. Um, which uh, was like a huge assault on Gaza, and then that was when Black Lives Matter sort of took off, and so we had these images. This is when sort of the intersectionality discourse in Palestine really got pushed into the public eye because we had these images of Ferguson and Palestine, and it was mm -hmm. the same tear mm -hmm. gas canisters, and mm -hmm. people from Gaza were sending advice on how to deal with tear gas, mm -hmm. and um, that's I think that's when, especially with Black Lives Matter in Palestine, things really got put together. And that was also a moment where I think those who were defending Israel and defending uh, the U.S. government really were put on the defensive for, for the first time, put on the defensive from people that weren't normally championing uh, Palestine or black lives mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, and so they had to say, wait a minute, like, I support Israel, but let me clarify that I'm not actually, you know, a terrible person mm. for doing that. Mm -hmm. Or um, the police are really important, but let me just explain that what's happened, like, let me put the blame somewhere else or rationalize mm. why um, I don't think that the Black Lives Matter protests are really important. Um, so that definitely helped a lot in people seeing that, so that, you know, the same people, it's the U.S. government, the U.S. police that are trained in Israel, mm -hmm. you know, the same companies that are operating the U.S. border are building checkpoints and manning the wall and things like that. Um, so that helped really bring it all to the forefront. And we ended up, the, the way we managed to sort of center Palestine in this was the way we drafted our resolution. Um, and we picked an illustrative, our Northwestern's investments were private because they're a private university. Mm. So we actually didn't know mm -hmm. what they were invested in. And we chose a handful of companies that were so large that it was likely that they were invested mm. in it and said, this is an illustrative list um, of companies that are involved. And we'd have, you know, a phrase about what they're doing in Palestine and why it's wrong. And then like a small phrase about what they're doing in other parts of the world. Mm. So for G4S, you know, they operate security, they're operating prisons, and they're doing that all over the world. They're mm -hmm. operating private prisons and abusing people in those systems. Um, and same thing with Elbit systems. They operate security in the occupied territories, and they're also contracted to operate security for the border. Um, so we US were, border. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we were able to sort of phrase it like that, but we made sure that this was, this was a... Uh, responding to the BDS call from Palestine and everyone was really sort of very understanding of that mm -hmm. because we had other things going on on campus at the time there was a Black Lives Matter movement and they were doing their own things and we would show up for that and mm -hmm. in this moment this is about black lives um, not about Palestine and we're here to support that um, so you know everyone had their moment in the Sun but we all sort of started to recognize at that point that is the same people and the same institutions and the same corporations that are perpetuating the systems of oppression all over the world. So uh, I imagine you had a lot of backlash to that campaign. Yes, we did. Can you talk a little bit about that and how you managed to get that passed over what I imagine was just overwhelming odds? Yeah. Well, I mean, we th not a single one of us thought that it was going to pass. That wasn't actually our, our goal. We, we thought that the obstacles were just so great that we wanted it to be a coalition building moment. Mm -hmm. We wanted to put ourselves out there and we wanted to have something that would, you know, exist when, once it was over. You know, once we had that debate on the resolution and, and it, in our minds, was, wasn't going to pass, that there would still be something there to work with. Um, so we weren't even aiming for that. Um, it was just kind of a nice... Nice surprise <laughs> after a seven hour debate. <laughs> um, but th I mean, there were, we kept it secret that we were planning to do this until we were ready to launch. So we had a launch date, and um, n I'm amazed that it didn't leak <laughs> beforehand, but it didn't. Um, and 
It was, it was actually very interesting. So we were planning as our first event of the campaign at Palestine 101, and a friend of mine and I were sort of giving just a basic talk about what's going on in Palestine and, and what the situation is. Um, and so we, we just scheduled that as an SJP event, and we didn't say anything about divestment, and we launched the divestment campaign the night before. Um, and there was sort of immediate uproar. People realized what was going on. Um, I think Hillel and there's a Zionist or there was a Zionist organization. They called themselves Wildcats for Israel. <laughs> Amusing. Um, sort of got together and started trying to put together a plan of action. And we thought we were going to get maybe 50 people at this talk. We filled a room made for 400. Um, everyone wanted to see what was going mm -hmm. on because it became clear that this was part of the divestment campaign. Mm -hmm. um, so what happened with s sort of opposition is that Hillel sort of organized a couple of groups into what they called a coalition for peace mm -hmm. um, to oppose the divestment resolution. Um, and there was, I mean, the administration sort of kept hands off while it was happening, um, but they didn't do anything to help us. And we had sort of administrative issues, reserving tables, reserving rooms after a while. And that's where um, the support, the coalition comes in, mm -hmm. because so like the Black, 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 Black Student Union would reserve stuff for us, and then we would just go in and use mm -hmm. it. Um, so we had little things like that. We had incidents with our banners being torn down, flyers being taken down, students getting sort of very upset. But for the most part, we didn't necessarily um, interact much with people outside of our events. Um, so there wasn't a whole lot of physical sort of presence of the backlash. It was just something that we were aware of. We knew that people were campaigning against us. Um, Surprisingly, though, people weren't really fooled by the Coalition for Peace. They said, what, what exactly are you proposing, except not that? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So it, it, became, it became clear that, that there wasn't a whole lot of concrete um, ideas coming from the other side. But still, it was difficult. I mean, student newspapers stopped wanting to publish our pieces. They said, we want to cover other things. Mm -hmm. um, there was always some kind of um, complaint if we, you know, we reserve these windows in the student center that you can paint on with special paint or something, and we painted a map of historical Palestine along with some other things and painted it green, and uh, there was an uproar for a long time about why we painted it green, and that's the color of the Palestinian flag, and it's green as land. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, really, that's really it, but people tried to sort of nitpick those things. Mm. A lot of the backlash came after the resolution was successful because I don't think that we were the only ones that didn't think it was going to pass. I think everyone, sort of APAC, um, the Israeli consulate in Chicago, no one thought that it was going to pass mm -hmm. at Northwestern, and so they weren't that concerned, they weren't that involved. Mm -hmm. When there's another university in Chicago, DePaul, when they did their resolution the year before, Stand with us. Had people on campus pretending to be students, um, encouraging people to vote no. They did a referendum, a student referendum. But so we didn't have any of that because they thought that Northwestern was a safe campus. Amazing. Um, so it was it was really afterwards that alumni got upset. Um, the the Israeli con some people from the Israeli consulate actually came to our divestment hearing. We found out, which was very intimidating. Um, but there was a lot of sort of agitation afterwards, and the administration didn't want to deal with us. We were putting together all these proposals for a socially responsible investment committee. People were getting sort of hate emails um, and, and messages on Facebook and things like that. Um, it, was, it was very difficult to walk around campus after that because it, the atmosphere was just so tense. Um, and there was a lot of social media um, um, social media, I don't, I don't even know what to call it, Th threats, but also just general hate. racist hate, hate. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, on Twitter and things like that, um, which at, at a certain point we just kind of turned it off because what can you do? Mm -hmm. um, Was there an attempt to, to overturn the, the resolution? Not while I was there. Mm -hmm. they, they were kind of scrambling to, um, to, to do something, and, mm -hmm. and 
for luckily for us, the the sort of Zionist uh, group on campus was not very well organized. Mm -hmm. They never needed to be. Um, that's one of the one of the blessings, I guess, of being a member of SJP is that when one side has so much res res so many resources and so much institutional support mm -hmm. from organizations outside, they don't sort of develop the the creativity mm -hmm. and the and the skill um, to organize effectively and quickly without. Um, a lot of preparation, uh -huh. without a lot of preparation. A lot of the time, mm -hmm. like with divestment campaigns, sometimes you just have to operate on the fly. Like when something happens, you react to it. Mm -hmm. um, there was a professor at Northwestern that published an article in the Chicago Tribune um, trashing our campaign. We had really just kicked off. Mm -hmm. And so we said, okay, we're writing a response. Mm -hmm. And we organized a few people, professors, alums, and students to write a response and had it turned around in 24 hours which was not something that the other side was do. capable of doing. It sounds like uh, part of the success at Northwestern was the stealth campaign. Yes. The, <laughs> if, the quiet campaign. If it had been known beforehand, we would have been shut down mm. before we even got off of the ground. And I wonder on uh, at UMass Amherst whether you have been dealing with this kind of opposition or how has that fit into the work that you've been doing? Absolutely, it always does. So I would say that in the spring of my junior year, so very recently, 2017, was when me and a few other women decided this group is not going to disappear. And so we thought a lot about how to make a statement, I guess you could say. What we ended up doing is, and this was an idea of one of our group members, is to build a mock apartheid wall, which is something that other groups had done all across the country. Uh, so we did it in a way that I think was very important, which is that we built uh, about five foot tall, 25 foot long wall, three separate panels, each had two sides. And each side was devoted to a different, I guess, aspect of the occupation or of social justice. So we had a Nakba uh, panel. We had a Movement for Black Lives panel that mm. said from Ferguson to Palestine, uh, which connected, you know, caught a lot of people's eye because, of course, at the time, still, still is, it's a very uh, relevant, relevant topic that m many more students are aware of. And they're sort of thinking when they see that, well, how does that connect to Palestine. And uh, so we had all of these different panels, we had posters, we had fact sheets, and we stood by the wall for three or four hours. It was in the, s the center of campus. Uh, and if you know UMass, you know that we have one of the tallest libraries ever. And so people, you know, some of my friends who were studying way up above said, I, I see you down there, <laughs> I see your wall. And I mean, it was huge, it was unavoidable. Mm. And of course, that was a very strong way to start out. Uh, it was a very difficult way to start out, but it was a very successful way to start out. So I would say that um, we did try to prepare our group by doing some de-escalation, uh, you know, we ran through some de-escalation de tactics with some group members. We assigned certain people who were very comfortable speaking with opposition to do that, to step in if that was something that other group members who were newer didn't feel comfortable doing. But then you get there and you're never really prepared for what's to come. So we had uh, someone who was not affiliated with UMass at all, I would say he was maybe in his 40s or 50s, come to campus and set up a humongous uh, blow up Pinocchio is what it was. And he stood with a sign. <laughs> it's, 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 it's humor, humorous. Yeah. So, uh, so he stood with a sign pointing to our wall that said fake news. And, you know, we were having lots of people pass by saying, you know, swearing at us, mm. calling us anti-Semitic. Mm. Um, but we had even more people coming up and saying, this is really awesome. You know, what, like, how did you put this together? Mm. What can we do to be supportive? I want to learn more. Will you just spend five minutes and talk with me about this? So uh, 
we had one girl, this is just a funny story, who was not affiliated with our group at all. And she came up and, you know, we had a really nice conversation and she was like, I love what you guys are doing. And then, you know, she walked away and I see out of the corner of my eye, I mean, this Pinocchio was hooked up to a generator and that's how big it was. (laughs) And this girl just runs by and unplugs the Pinocchio and the whole thing just deflated. It was awesome. (laughs) And so... You know, you have comedy of errors. Right? Yeah. Right? I have to say that's the most creative sort of yes. backlash technique I've ever yes. heard of. <laughs> and, you know, I think everyone was kind of like, why is this 50 year old man who's not why does he affiliated? Have a right? Yes. Like, where did this, did you rent it? Do you just have <laughs> it, it come from? on, you know, just for personal use? We didn't know. Um, you know, that was funny, but then there was some more very serious backlash, which was that a lot of Hillel students came up and sort of actually cornered me and, you know, were accusing me of anti-Semitism, of accusing our group of anti-Semitism, accusing what we had put out, which was all factual information with source specific information, uh, connected to it. And I said, you know, I listed my email at the bottom of this flyer. If you'd like to contact me, I can send you the sources. Pulled out his phone and he said, I just sent you an email asking for the sources. Mm -hmm. So it's very, it's very intimidating. It's very threatening. I mean, this is a man who was double my size Mm -hmm. and um, has all of this institutional power and support, right? You feel both the, uh, the physical power and you also feel the emotional power of being accused of anti-semitism what does that mean you know Mm -hmm. i had never been called an anti-semite in my entire life that was that was a really hard moment for me Mm -hmm. um and i didn't know how to deal with it but i would say that out of everything difficult comes something really amazing and after the event and this is goes back to the importance of really having a solid support network uh, is that me and the other women who built the wall sat down and we had, we just kind of decompressed and having that was everything. I mean, it was such a difficult, overwhelming, exhausting day, but to go back to it two days later and say, you know what, this is what happened. This is how we're moving forward. We're not intimidated. We're not going to be threatened. We're not going to be stopped. And I ended up uh, writing a piece about uh, about it. And uh, I was invited to speak at the um, at the uh, <clears throat> excuse me at the Palestine Advocacy Projects. Uh, was it the fiftieth or seventieth year of occupation? Uh, we marched from. Um, City Hall in Cambridge to Harvard Square and before they had a few speakers and I was one of them and um, I felt in that moment like my understanding of how to organize and how to be effective and how to, you know, preserve my sort of identity at the same time uh, all came together and it was a really powerful moment. but looking back, you know, it is, there's always, you know that it's coming, you know, Mm -hmm. and to have that, and that's sort of the point of it, is that there's this, always this looming threat that you will be, uh, you will have this backlash. It, it's supposed to detract from what you're doing and it's supposed to suppress what you're doing and it's supposed to try and you know, that's, I mean, it's intentional the way that they do that. It's the threat is supposed to be so, so intimidating that you just stop organizing. Go ahead. The other thing that I would add to that, it's just the kind of backlash that you get. I mean, part of organizing um, for Palestine, when you're, when you're Arab, and especially if you're, mm-hmm. you're Palestinian, like this is your identity. And mm-hmm. when people ba- like say, oh, you're telling lies, like none of this is happening. It's not just saying we're debating about facts. Mm-hmm. or we disagree with your political position. It's more of a it's, a, it's a personal attack. Like people will say, oh, let's just talk about, you know, the politics of the situation, right. let's not make it personal. But part of the thing about being Palestinian is that the, your existence and who you are and your entire, you know, people's history, your family's history, everything is a political statement. Mm-hmm. It's a political threat mm-hmm. to um, the status quo and to the establishment. So you're putting all of yourself 
into these things and backlash is incredibly you know painful and scary and difficult to deal with in that respect mm -hmm. um, which is why it's it's so important to have the support network but also to be close with the people that mm -hmm. you're organizing with like when I after I graduated, when I work with uh, SJPs at different universities, I always say, do you guys hang out together? Because you need to be friends. You need right. to know each other really well. You need to be able to like see someone and say, someone just cut you down. Like, Take a break. Like, mm -hmm. Come talk about it. Let me stand in for you for a minute. You need to have those sort of close emotional connections with the people that you're working with because there's a lot of emotion that goes into it. It's mm -hmm. impossible to be completely detached and just academic about it. Right. And to be with people who know you outside of your organizing, yeah. who know really know you. You know, like you're know not, you as a person, not yeah, as the, the right. Palestinian mm -hmm. agitator. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And support you personally. <laughs> right. Absolutely. It sounds as though from your experiences the backlash actually has had the opposite effect, mm -hmm. has made your resolve stronger. Is that one of how you experience yes. it? Yes. And also too, I mean, the backlash in and of itself is racialized and gendered always. Uh, I always have found that if we bring women to the university, Palestinian women, they are always found to be less threatening. There's always less backlash than when we bring a male Palestinian to campus, 100% of the time. The other thing is that uh, at the same event, this, this mock apartheid wall event, uh, one of our co-organizers, co Ananya, uh, is, is, her family's from India. She's a lot, her complexion is a lot darker than mine. And so although I'm the only one there, or me and my brother who are Palestinian, who are Arab, Ananya actually received most of the backlash because her complexion was so much darker than my brother's and, and mine. Um, and so people would come up to her screaming, "You're you Arabs!" You know, really blanket mm -hmm. state statementing her uh, ethnicity and and her background. Mm -hmm. And that was so interesting to me because you have no idea who any of these people yes, are. You course. don't know anything except that here I am mm -hmm. in front of this wall, and this is what I support. That's all you know about me. Mm -hmm. But the the stereotypes and the the blanket statements that were made were astounding mm -hmm. to me. I mean, it wasn't just, you know, race that was a factor. It was Arab or Middle Eastern, you know, Muslim. these, right, Muslim, mm -hmm. you know, none of us are Muslim. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, in, in their eyes, we all right. are. Right. Yes. And so that yes. was a really interesting moment for me because that also opened up, you know, this is a bigger problem than just Palestine. This is bigger than just uh, just one issue. This is racism. Yeah. And uh, the other thing that I really want, wanted to uh, talk about is that even within organizing around Palestine, it's very, uh, you know, and when you're receiving this backlash, uh, a lot of the time you'll see your male counterpart, although they are also organizing on behalf of Palestine, sort of step in and take, you know, take the wheel. Mm. And so I, I found at that same event, a lot of women uh, in our group doing a wonderful job of explaining and, and uh, de-escalating situations in which Zionist uh, students were coming up and really being aggressive. You'll have a, a man step in and say, oh, well, let me just take care of this. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that was a really interesting moment as well. Um, and that's actually what led me to think about how we can make Palestine, the issue of Palestine, more, I don't want to say inclusive, but uh, more feminist, you know? Mm -hmm. so, um, so what I decided to do, and we had had so many male speakers that, who are all wonderful, wonderful speakers, but all men. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, having this group be pieced back together by women, we were like, we want this to open up. And uh, what I had thought a lot about was how Palestinian women are on these front lines of resistance. You see it in the Great Return March in Gaza. They've been on the front lines, you know, for, they were on the front lines for weeks. And they also have their families to think about and their children and their men are in jail, their husbands are in jail. So what is their life, what is that dual ro role of being a mother, of being you know, a community member and also being a, a badass activist? Mm -hmm. You know, What does that look like 
for for these women and uh so i i thought a lot about why that wasn't talked about ever and i realized that it's because a lot of these conversations have historically been dominated by male voices and my grandfather being one of my feminist heroes really inspired me to to not settle for that mm mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I put together this event Reproductive Justice Intersectional Feminism in Palestine. It was completely a panel of women, two Palestinian women uh and uh actually one amazing Jewish feminist living in the United States who has done myriad work across uh advocating for Palestinian motherhood and um and Loretta Ross who is one of the founders of the Reproductive Justice Framework. And I brought these women together and uh gosh they were amazing you know it was more than i could have hoped for and it really opened up the conversation to talk about not only what does it look like to be a palestinian woman woman living under occupation but also why can't these women why can't they organize around issues of gender and sexuality mm-hmm. well because they're being so hindered by the occupation and they actually are doing this work but it's so suppressed and you have Israel's whole pinkwashing campaign that uh really detracts from the work that they're doing and i wanted to make it very clear look don't you know do not criticize internal palestinian civil society unless you are doing something to actively resist the occupation mm-hmm. and that turnout for that event was nothing like we've ever had before i would say probably about 130 people showed up mm-hmm. um i mean that was way bigger than anything we'd ever had and of course loretta ross was a big part of that she's a big name but um you know people were interested to know they didn't understand why gender and sexuality weren't a part of internal Palestinian civil society or why it couldn't be organized as fully and expansively as it could mm-hmm. and these women you know told them exactly why that that was and i think that really brought a lot of you know the backlash that i had received as an internal you know Palestinian adv- advocate and then also dealing with zionist backlash these things became apparent to me and they really um funneled themselves into a much m- deeper conversation I think than we were having before. I- I'm glad you raised the issue of Gaza and women because there's been so little publicity of the role that women are playing in the right of return march. And I wonder building on that what you both are thinking in terms of moving your work now to focus around what's happening in Gaza right now. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah. I think that um what's happening in Gaza is just it's this it's just sort of all encompass uh, encompassing of everything that's been happening for the past 70 years. Like mm-hmm. it happened at the exactly the right moment with the move of the embassy to mm-hmm. Jerusalem and the great return march and the 70 year anniversary and you it's just pushed everything to the forefront. 70 years of yeah, the Nakba. Yes, yeah, mm-hmm. since 1948. Um it just it just pushed everything to the forefront. Like there is sort of an insurmountable barrier between Gaza and the current state of Israel. So what it's you know there's no real threat to Israel that these people are going to be able to cross over mm-hmm. that fence and and get and get there. Um but it it's just putting they said, you know what? We're fed up. We've had enough. Mm-hmm. The occupation has created unlivable space. Mm-hmm. Um and these are our rights and we're going to stand here and we're going to demonstrate and camp out until people pay attention. Um and it's it's sort of it's shifted the focus a lot. There's a lot of distraction, you know, from let's talk about negotiations and let's talk about a two-state solution and and we forget um that it's really about people. Mm-hmm. Uh and and it's about a much wider group of people than the traditional discourse really includes, mm-hmm. including the diaspora, mm-hmm. refugees in other countries, mm-hmm. re- uh Palestinians living within the state of Israel. And so this sort of I feel like it's a really good moment to to try and reframe that conversation, to take it away from the traditional uh two-state solution negotiations kind of rut that we've been in for 25 years. Um and and also I think we haven't heard a lot about women in the great return march it's really not surprising that tends to happen with every big movement i mean the the uprisings in egypt in 2011 were masterminded by women but we didn't hear about that mm-hmm. either mm-hmm. um 
and, and that's something that, that's sort of like internal organizing politics that I think is pretty pervasive wherever you are. It's mm -hmm. something that, that I experienced um, with uh, NU Divest. You know, we're always sort of bringing it back, talking about why men are not t willing to take on jobs that don't put them in the spotlight. Mm -hmm. um, and there even been, uh, Nadine Naber actually wrote a really great book called Arab America about organizing mostly in the Bay Area in the 90s and, and this was, she had almost a whole chapter on this because mm. it, it just, it's just, it's this pattern where women put in so much work and I think it's part of the way that we're socialized that we, we put in the work because we believe in what we're doing mm -hmm. and we want to support our community okay. and, and we don't, don't care so much about putting ourselves in the spotlight mm -hmm. um, and men have, are socialized to want to, to get credit and to be mm -hmm. recognized for the work that they do. And not that they shouldn't be recognized for the work that they do, but there needs to be a little bit not more. Not at the expense of the women. Right, right. Um, work. So it's, it's, some, it's, it's work that needs to happen from all sides, mm -hmm. from media, from the organizers themselves. They need to pay attention to who's being put in front of the cameras. Also, I think there needs to be recognition that sometimes not everyone wants their face to be. Mm -hmm to be public. They don't want their name to be public. They want to do the work, but for any myriad of reasons, family, safety, whatever, mm -hmm. um, don't want their face to be public, but it's still important to recognize that women are doing the work, even if you're not going to name the names, if, if that's not something that they want. It's a very sort of complicated um, like balance, and it's very individualized preference how public you want to be about the work that you're doing. I mean, I worked with some people who they had family members still living in the West Bank. And so they really didn't want their face or their name on anything because they wanted to still be able to go back and see them. And, and, we, had, and we worked with that mm -hmm. um, as much as we could. So there are these sort of delicate balance lines and, and, and there's a delicate balance to, to sort of credit and publicity and all of that with organizing. But I think we're at a really like good moment to sort of change all of that. S that's a... a perfect segue to I think my last question to both of you which is what are your plans going forward given this rich experience that you both had already organizing and moving forward on the uh, justice for Palestine but connected with all these other movements given that the crisis where Palestine is right now what are your plans uh, moving forward start with you Lila so my my first step is to actually visit Palestine next month uh, for the first time. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing this work for about four years and I've never been. And I'm really excited to have that opportunity, not only because I think it will bring everything full circle for me, but also because this is my family. You know, I want, I want to see them. I want to see where they're living. And, and of course, you know, you have the occupation, you have all of these these miserable living conditions that these people are, are my people are subject subjected to but at the same time you have that loving arab culture that just wants you to eat food all like, of the time eat. and be happy <laughs> and and be comfortable and you know well fed and well taken and care above of all, please eat more food <laughs> yes and that's something that you know under occupation and under all of these political you know this political turmoil that people forget is that like as you know, I've never known Palestinians as these helpless people. I've known them as my family. I've known them as strong people. I've known them as loving people. I've known them as some of the best people I've ever met. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that really gets taken away when you're when you're politicizing Palestine so much. So that's my first step. I'm really obviously interested in the intersection between uh, race and gender and politics and occupation and things like that. So, I mean, to the last point, I would say that Palestinian women have never been hindered by occupation. They have been radicalized by it. Mm -hmm. And it's actually, uh, in my opinion, it's, it's advanced uh, their capacity to exercise, uh, you know, justice and, and peace and um, to pave a way to a, a society internal and external that is free from subjugation in its complete sense. And I think this is not something that uh, we're not dealing with here. This is something we're dealing with here. Uh, you know, patriarchy exists everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so we have everything to learn from these women um, and the men who are so supportive of them, uh, whether that be from inside of a prison or, or next to them, supporting them. Um, so I think my next step too, and is just to 
go and see and take pictures and do what I can uh, and just be with my family and then come back. And I mean, one of the most effective tools for me has just been to write about my experiences. Uh, I think that's something that has always helped me piece together what my next step is going to be. But in the future, you know, whatever institutions I'm a part of, they're all connected to humanity and to social justice. Uh, you know, so, so using that institutional power in a way that promotes those ideas and, uh, and justice here in the United States and in Palestine and all around the world uh, is, is what I see for myself and whatever I decide to do. That's up in the air right now. <laughs> well, we look forward to your impressions from Palestine. Thank you. Yes. And I think it's going to be an amazing, Thank amazing you. experience for you. Um, Dahlia, your next steps and sort of building on what's happening in Palestine yeah. now? I mean, um, that my, my, my experience with SJP and organizing is actually kind of what led me to law school. I thought that having that degree would be really helpful to be able to sort of find ways to be useful mm -hmm. um, in this movement going forward. So that, that is sort of the ultimate goal. But one of the, one of the really sort of genius aspects that are, of BDS, I think, is that it's, you use it wherever you are. Mm -hmm. um, there is, you know, every institution, every organization, every society is complicit in some way in something. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea is not necessarily to just drop everything and, and go and work on one particular issue or like go to Palestine and try to do something there. You know, you need support all over, right. the, all over the world in, in, every, in every institution. So wherever I end up, like Lila said, the goal would be to work to sort of bring that institution sort of into a um, sort of socially conscious role to use whatever power and privilege I might have um, to raise up voices of others and bring this issue to the forefront and try and fight, you know, for justice. And hopefully down the line in my uh, career, I'll be able to, you know, help in a, in a, in a concrete way. And so you are going to a wonderful position. Yes, I have a, a fellowship with the Immigrant Justice Corps for two years. So I'll be doing, uh, I'll be representing um, uh, asylum seekers uh, in the United States. And then after that, we'll see. <laughs> But you can bring all of the work and experience that you've had to this position yes. and hopefully continue the conversation with a new, with a new audience. Yes, absolutely. And, and you know, Pal so one of the, the, the crux of the Palestinian issue is that Palestinians are refugees. They were made re refugees in 1948, and so there's that automatic link with all other refugee crises mm -hmm. um, all over the world, uh, and, and it's... it's it's the one refugee group that usually gets left out of the conversation mm -hmm. when we start talking about refugee flows and so on. Um, and so I think that it's really important to sort of reintroduce that uh, aspect into sort of broader immigration and refugee work. Mm -hmm. Well, we're also looking forward to the progress you make in uh, connecting Palestinians to other asylum seekers issues here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you both so Thank much, you. Lila and Dahlia, and we wish you both the best of luck and really look forward to following your career paths and that you continue the wonderful work you've both been doing. Thank you. That's our show for today. On behalf of all of the volunteers uh, of the Arabic Hour, I'm Susan Akram. See you next time.